the cycling podcast in association with Rafa. From grand tours to group rides, the Champs Elysees to coffee shops, Rafa exists to celebrate the world's most beautiful sport. Where are we, Lionel? We are in central London at a cafe. <laughs> cafe, that wasn't whose it. Whose name is right behind me on the wall? Vermuteria, the vermouth, the vermouth, the vermouthery. Is that <laughs> quite by accident? We've stumbled upon a cycling cafe that also specialises in vermouth. A very right. nice, a oh very nice, nice word. drink. Well, and you're having a nice afternoon latte there, Napalm. Yep, that's allowed, is it, Daniel? It's allowed when Daniel's not around, but Daniel is on the other end of the line. Hello, Daniel. A, a latte in a vermouth cycling cafe. I'm not really <laughs> sure about that, chat. <laughs> kind of uh, <laughs> scratching my Poor head here. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. I'm all right. Um, I was okay. I was fine until about 20 seconds ago. But yeah. Well, there's some very nice uh, memorabilia on the walls in this cafe, including a couple of Pegaretti frames on the wall, which I guess would be worth quite a lot of money. Um I'm on a bit of a creaky chair as well. I might have to stay still. How are you, Daniel, anyway, out there in sunny Majorca? I'm okay. I'm okay. Have you been um, skateboarding, yes. cycling, running? No, no, rehab's over. Back on the trails now, running again, Rich. Great. That's good to hear. Um, well, what are we doing this week, fellas? We've got a bit more from your uh, foray to de Kooning. Quick step, Lionel. Um, we're going to talk a little bit in this episode about some of the young riders who we might expect to see something of this year we've got a couple of interviews with them and we're gonna hear from peter vakoch as well who is about to return to racing after a terrible crash last year about a year ago in south africa wasn't it he was with brioche bob jungles at the time he was and uh lawrence de plus they were training at altitude in south africa and uh vakoch was clipped by a truck and suffered terrible injuries and missed a season of his career um, de Kooning Quickstep have extended his contract because he was out of contract he wasn't he was out he? of contract they've given him a year to basically get back to full fitness and he resumes racing in Argentina this weekend indeed well before we uh, look back a little bit on the Tour Down Under as well have you got a news roundup for us please Lionel I have yeah and I'll start with the Tour Down Under where Richie, not? Richie Port won on Willunga Hill for the sixth year in a row. Now, a quiz question for both of you. Who was the last rider before Richie Port? Don't look at my screen, Richard. Who was the last rider before Richie Port to win a stage of the Tour Down Under on Willunga Hill? Lewis Leon Sanchez. Lewis Leon Sanchez. Incorrect. Simon Gerrans. There we are. There we are. Yes, it was. Ah, huh. Interesting. Anyway, Richie Port won enjoyed on the... Enjoyed that, Nepal. Enjoyed that little quiz. Can yeah, we do more of that? I'll sort of throw one in each week yeah, if I can. that'd be good. I'll forget, obviously. So that's a one-off. Um, enjoy that while it lasts. The other stories from the Tour Down Under were that Daryl Impey won overall for the second year in a row uh, for Mitchelton Scott. Uh, Patrick Bevan had ridden really well all week. Uh, but had a crash, unfortunately, and was unable to successfully de- defend the ochre leader's jersey on the final stage. Caleb Ewan, who won the People's Choice Classic just before the Tour Down Under, uh, thought he'd got his first World Tour win of the season for Lotto Sudal, but was disqualified or relegated um, after a movement of the head, shall we put it like that? Uh, basically, he nudged. A headbutt. Uh, he, he headbutted. I did, it, I, did it, I, I did enjoy watching that being discussed by, of all people, Stuart O'Grady and Robbie McKeon. Yeah. <laughs> It's a bit like when you see Roy Keane, uh, you know, analysing dirty tackles mm. on, on football matches. What year was that? I think that was 2005 or six. No, before that. 2000 no, and f- really? it, we, it was, was definitely it? a tour that I was at. Ah, OK. So it was five or six. But they came, they really went head to head, didn't they? There, that was, a, there yeah. were a couple of nudges either way. Um, this was a... No, I mean, it was obvious from every camera angle, uh, probably the correct decision, really. You can't go nudging your head at sprint rivals, no matter how much you want the wheel in front of you, can you? I mean, that's just the rules. I kind of admire Caleb Ewan for it. He's not a big lad, is he? He's, he's, he's diminutive. Uh, so for him to put the heat on someone, as they say in Glasgow, <laughs> I, I quite, I take my hat off to him uh, for trying. Scott, yeah, well, yeah the, the, the Scott. They're admiring open good, aggression. Good Scottish surname, doesn't he, <laughs> Caleb Ewan? Anyway, he didn't win that stage. Uh, Jasper Philipson, a young rider making his debut for UAE Team Emirates, did. 
Um, so that was the Tour Down Under for the year. A very familiar flavour to it. Really hot temperatures again, um, on some of the days at least. Uh, there's a bit of a lull in the middle, but uh, nudging 40 plus degrees. Um, so, yeah, hot, hot race. And uh, they'll be carrying on in Australia with the uh, Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race before... Um, well, most of them will be heading back to Europe, I guess, or via the Middle East, perhaps, on their way back to the European road season. Another big story from the Tour Down Under was the retirement of Matt Heyman. He turned professional in January 2000, uh, which was the month that Remco Evenepoel of De Kooning Quickstep was born. That uh, puts that into context, doesn't mm. it? A long career for Matt Heyman. Turned pro for Rabobank, he rode for Sky, and then Orica, now Mitchelton Scott. Biggest win, of course, was... 2016 Paris Bay, which came after he had um, crashed and fractured his collarbone. Is, is that el- elbow, elbow arm? I should know this because we did a friend special with him reliving his Paris Bay win, didn't we? I was trying to set you up there for a, for a plug for our 2016 Friends of the Podcast special, or was it 2017? 17. Um, you can still uh, sign up and listen to that on the cyclingpodcast.com. We uh, sat and watched, I went to Paris Nice, and he and I sat and watched the. The, the last hour of, of Pyro Bay. Uh, it was that was that was your idea to do that, Lionel, but it was great. And I don't think he'd actually, it was the first time he'd watched it. And and, and just to, you know, relive it with him like that was, was, was fantastic. Well, from road racing in the heat to off-road racing in the freezing cold, the Cyclocross World Cup's penultimate round was held um, Pont Chateau in France. And Wout van Aert won his first round of the season, breaking Matthew van der Poel's run of five wins in a row. Mariana Voss won her second consecutive World Cup. She's clinched the overall title uh, with a race to spare because the final round is the Grand Prix Adrie van der Poel, named after Matthew van der Poel's dad, of course, in Hoogerheide in the Netherlands. The men's title is all up for grabs because only three points separate Wout van Aert, the overall leader, and Toon Aerts. So it's Van Aert or Aerts for the overall win this season. Um, a few bits of racing news that relate to events rather than uh, upcoming events rather than things that have happened. Um, the Hammer Series has been confirmed for 2019. There'll be three rounds of that. One in Stavanger in Norway in May, in Limburg in the Netherlands in early June and in Hong Kong in October. Um, you're punching the air there, Richard, with, with enthusiasm for the Hammer Series. We, we've yet to actually make it to a round. It's uh, you, pro- timing, you promised. You promised, Lionel. I promised two years ago, mm. but like my promise, you also tore down yeah, under. Exactly. It, lots of empty promises. promises. Empty <laughs> promises. Yeah. Um, the new uh, road race that will finish on Mont Ventoux in June has also been confirmed. That will be uh, something to look forward to. Hope they manage to get that on the TV so we can watch it. Um, anyone who's ridden round there will know those roads really well. Um, sort of approaches uh, Mont Ventoux and then finishes on the top as long as you know they don't get a really windy day that would be real unfortunate for that event wouldn't it if it was a terribly windy day like we had when the Tour de France went there a few years ago of course the new liege baston liege route has been confirmed as we already knew the finish this year will be in the city centre for the first time since I think 1991 and the the holy trinity of the Côte de Wan the Côte de Stockau and the Côte de la haute Leve are back and, uh, yeah, it's going to change the complexion of that race uh, entirely, one would suspect. And finally, Daniel's a big fan of indoor racing on the track, as we know. But there's some indoor racing with a difference. And, Richard, you're going to be there tonight for mm. the inaugural Zwift Kiss Super League eSports racing. I mean, this is, this is uh, quite an innovation. Yep. Very open-minded, as you know, Lionel. Yep. I'll be going along there with my eyes open. And my your mind, mind my mind very open. Riders and from, I'll report back next week. Riders from Cofidis, the Israel Cycling Academy, Wiggins Lacole and others are taking part in um, in this. And uh, yeah, it feels like a quite an innovation, doesn't it? Racing on Zwift with riders who we will, you know, we will we will know. Yeah, looking forward to that. A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Thank you very much to Rafa, our headline sponsor. Still very grateful to them for their uh, support. It's much appreciated. And keeps our show on the road. And they've launched their own show, which I mentioned last week. Gone Racing uh, will be following 
Team EF Education First, who they are, of course, supplying with clothing this year. Um, and episode three, I think it is, has just gone out of Gone Racing, and it focuses on Michael Woods and his efforts to win the Walunga Hill stage. Or, what, what, sorry, what's the proper title for that stage, Daniel? Walunga Hill, mate. That's the one. <laughs> um, and... Uh, yeah, it, it's really good because Mike Woods is just a compelling uh, a character. Uh, you said it before, Lionel, he's very human, isn't he? And that comes across. Um, so I hope a lot of the films will be following him, actually, because he's got such a good story to tell and he tells it so well. So I enjoyed that insight into his preparation for that stage and it didn't, didn't win in the end, but it was fascinating just how... Uh, much work he'd put into wrecking the the climb and the descent and uh, yeah I mean Richie Port is is almost unbeatable on Willunga Hill mate isn't he well for six years six years he he that's the very definition of unbeatable <laughs> yeah not not a big surprise was it um, but I, I noticed people sort of searching for um, pointers as to what Richie Port might do um, for the rest of the season based on this performance. I mean, if those previous victories have taught us anything, it's really that they don't really say an awful lot about how well he might or might not do in the race that is his focus, uh, what well, is going to be his focus this season as well, the Tour de France. Um, how do you think he'll, he'll get on this year, chaps? Because... Um, last year, at the particularly at the Vuelta, he, he sort of got sent to the Vuelta um, for BMC. Of course, BMC were winding down. There wasn't a very good atmosphere, I don't think, in the team at the Vuelta. Or um, everyone was kind of going their separate ways. Richie Port felt that he was... Uh, I got the impression he, he felt that he was being punished almost by being sent, well, to the Vuelta and then um, to... Races later on in the season, um, I think Jim, Jim Ovitz told him he'd get his bag back in Madrid. Didn't he? <laughs> well, there you go, yeah, um, yeah. The Chinese race at the end of the year, and um, and then you know I, I spoke to him one day at the Vuelta last year, and he, he talked about how he was he just couldn't wait to change teams and um, looking ahead to 2019, he was he was um, quite pleased or, or excited at the prospect of, of doing something, doing different races, changing things up and not necessarily making the Tour de France the be all and end all of his season. That said, um, I think as far as his team concern, is concerned, it will be the, the main focus of his 2019 season. Yeah, it's very easy to say sort of Groundhog Day on Willunga Hill, really. And every year we've had this debate, haven't we? What does this mean for Richie Port season going forward? And and our foreign colleagues, our non-English speaking uh, fo- uh, colleagues, although they do speak English, just not as a first language, often kind of raise their eyebrows um, politely at the suggestion that Richie Port is a, a, a real genuine contender for Grand Tours. And uh, it does mystify people um, that who, uh, you know, aren't, uh, English speaking uh, why Port is always so high up the, the list of potential winners when you know his Grand Tour record is, uh, is so-so really but it was important for Port to win his first race with Trek Segafredo, very high profile transfer, uh, quite a protracted one as well and, and it kind of overshadowed uh, the Vuelta, the start of the Vuelta for him really, especially as he got ill on the eve of the race and so was never likely to be in contention in Spain. Um, but he's 34 years old next week, you know he's not a spring chicken, um, it would be extraordinary uh, if he were to win a Grand Tour at this stage of his career. Fan- fanciful, isn't it? It is extremely fanciful. I'm I just mean, setting, my, setting myself <laughs> up for yeah. some, uh, um, some some blowback at the end of the season. But you know, he's got an impressive array of week-long stage races under his belt. You know, a couple of Paris-Nice, Tour of Romandy, Catalonia, Tour de Suisse. He's got the tools, hasn't he? I mean, that's why yeah. he's been on people's radar. He can time trial, he can climb, um, and... You look at that, and we've looked at that for the last six or seven years, and thought, you know, he's got the the raw ingredients to be a contender over three weeks. But you need more than that. And well, and except yeah, except except one, Rich. I mean, there's always this bias among cycling fans and cycling pundits towards physical, physiological abilities. And and as you say, mm. Richie Port can do it all. Uh, uh, in that respect, he's he's probably the best climber in the world on his day. But the big 
um, other prerequisite for doing well in major tours is the ability to put a three-week race together, and that's his big Achilles heel, isn't it? Shoot, uh, shoot at the du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, at the back of the pack, please. That's the voice of Seb Piquet, race radio at the Tour de France, to remind us to tell you that this episode of the cycling podcast is sponsored by The Economist. The Economist is a smart guide to the forces impacting your world. It's about far more than just economics and finance. It covers a range of subjects from world politics and business to science, technology, the arts, the environment and even sport. It helps readers prepare for what's going on in the world around them, sifting through the noise, focusing on the essential information and telling the real story. It's for the kind of person who never stops asking questions and wants to know why the world is the way it is. Richard, you've been reading The Economist this week. What's leapt out at you? A story with a headline that um, is four wheels better, which is a headline we would obviously dispute here on the cycling podcast. But it's actually about uh, a city, uh, the biggest city in Myanmar, Yangon, where motorbikes are banned. Nobody knows why, but they've been banned since 2003. One rumour is that before the military rule ended in 2016, a biker threatened a general with a finger gun gesture and was able to escape with ease. Uh, another rumour is that the general's daughter died in a motorcycle accident. It, it seems as, as arbitrary as that, that somebody's, somebody high up has taken a decision to ban motorbikes from the, the city centre. It's had a huge impact on congestion there. Um, and it's also had an impact on the burgeoning courier industry. Bikes are preferred, oh. are used, obviously, by the, uh, the couriers in, in that city. But... It's really interesting because in Asian cities in particular, uh, motorbikes and, and, you know, are, are very common and make journeys a lot quicker for a lot of people. Uh, so it's just a, a kind of quirky story that caught my eye and uh, very interesting. The motorbike fanatics in Yangon tend to go out at night and uh, just hope they don't get caught. Wow, fascinating. Well, if you want to read The Economist on a regular basis, uh, why not try it out? You can get a free print copy of The Economist delivered to you if you live in the UK by texting the word cycling to 78070. That's cycling, C-Y-C-L-I-N-G, to 78070. Now, Lionel, we mentioned at the start we were going to look a little bit in this episode at some of the young riders who we might uh, might see in, in the results this year. Uh, but we're going to look at one very young rider indeed who we might not see in the results this year. It, it's hard to know. He's 18 years old still, Remco Evenepoel. Uh, and you were at the uh, De Koenig Quick Step team launch a couple of weeks ago. He was there, but he was very much in demand, I gather. Yeah, he was. An, an awful lot of attention on Evenepoel. Um, anyone who saw the way he won the World Junior Road Race at the World Championships in Innsbruck last year, yeah. Uh, well, Richard, you were there. Did you see I, I much was of there. that race? I was actually, it was the CPA election that day, and I was up in the hotel with some uh, other journalists and writers, and it was actually a break. There was a, 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 an interval in proceedings during the election, and Gianni Bugno, who was uh, the president, David Miller, Bernie Eisel, um, Marco Haller, and a few others appeared, uh, and, and we all sat and watched the, the race on my computer. Um, and you know they were all kind of transfixed by it because Evenepoel had crashed. He'd um, he had you know he was a, a two minute deficit to make up, and it was extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, he just rode through the field and, and won the race. He he you know he, he'd completely written, he was a favourite, but you would you'd written him off. He was he was well down, and it wasn't you know it wasn't such a challenging course that you thought that his strength would tell in the end it was an amazing ride and and everybody was was actually absolutely hooked yeah i mean there's been a lot of um, a lot of attention on Evenepoel. he is well he's 18 for another couple of days um he will be 19 on friday january the 25th burns night Burns night, Shared yeah. The I think of Robert Burns, yeah. Oh, that's done, done a lot of this already oh, this year. Goodness we? me, don't get Daniel on Scottish historical figures again. Um, and he's making his debut for De Koenig Quick Step at the uh, Vuelta de San Juan in Argentina. And it's difficult to know what to expect in this first year. And also, I suppose the big question is, is it too young to be turning professional at world tour level? And uh, that was one of the questions I was asking people at um, the De Koenig Quick Step press 
uh, launch. Uh, Patrick Lefevre made the point that you know he's such an obvious talent that if they hadn't signed him, somebody else would have done, and it's their job to get in and sign riders, and, and it's their responsibility to look after him and make sure that, that the pressure doesn't build too much. Um, but, of course, we know that in Belgium, uh, pressure... It goes with the territory, doesn't it? There's such a history. Uh, the press, you know, they always draw the comparisons. Will he be the new Eddie Merckx? I mean, it starts almost before he's turned a pedal. Um, and I suppose watching over the off-season, you know, the launch of a kind of clothing range by some of his fans um, with sort of gold leaf lettering and logo, um, perhaps, you know, people getting carried away on his behalf uh, rather than him himself getting carried away. But an interesting um, character because of the talent he has. But also, as a child, he was a very promising footballer. He was on the books of Anderlecht, a uh, top Belgian club, and also PSV Eindhoven before going back to Anderlecht, and then discovering cycling and really becoming very good at it very, very quickly. And uh, almost immediately was on um, Quickstep's radar. I didn't actually speak to Evenepoel at the press launch. He was did a lot of TV and then kind of spirited away a little bit. But I did speak to Tim de Klerk, who anyone who's watched the Grand Tours will have seen de Klerk on the front of the peloton for hour after hour. One of the real workhorses um, who chases down the breakaways when none of the other teams want to help to set up a stage win last year for either Viviani or uh, Gaviria or whoever. Um, and de Klerk will be one of the uh, more mature, more experienced figures who will, I guess, be mentoring Evenepoel. So I asked him uh, what kind of pressures are going to be on uh, an 18-year-old, nearly 19-year-old, as he gets to grips with the World Tour. Normally, I would say let it wait a little bit, but we also have a saying what, what's, uh, what is good comes quickly, and I think uh, he's uh, for sure physically ready, I think, to ride, uh, to ride with the pros. I think everybody can say... Uh, He's an uh, exceptional talent. I think there is uh, no better place to let him develop than, uh, than here in the team. Uh, I think we all have uh, our duty to, 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 make it, uh, to make him as, uh, as, as good as possible. So it will, it, uh, will take so a while, but uh, I think he, he for sure has, uh, has it in him. There were a lot of guys that were uh, really big talent in, in, the, in the youth. But I don't think uh, we don't have a, we have not seen such a thing in a, in a long time in Belgium. What was he doing before he was cycling? Uh, he was uh, playing uh, soccer, so I think he was also really good. But I think he's uh, he's gonna be, be even better in uh, in cycling. For sure, I, I already said him that uh, a lot of times that when I was uh, 18, for sure I, I was also. Uh, drinking beer a lot more than he, I was uh, studying I was uh, but I could never in a in, uh, hundred years I could even uh, cope with cope with all the training load he, he has here if I've done that when I was his age I would I would have been uh, killed I think <laughs> so in uh, that in that point of view you can already see that he's a uh, really trainable and uh, for sure his, his physique uh, is, is uh, moving in the, in, in the best way to to, to be a real champion and I think also what's even more important than that he has a, the right attitude he, he wants to learn but for, uh, also he want, really wants to prove himself that he's uh, as good as, as they say and uh, I think it's now up to us that maybe we can um, learn him here and there what, what, what uh, are the important things and where, where he should be focused on and also uh, try to uh, lower him a little bit because uh, in his own he, he always wants to do more and, and he has a, a really hunger uh, hunger to train and hunger to perform so uh, did you see him win the world title did you watch the race I mean it was amazing wasn't it yeah yeah of course uh, I think it was uh, maybe even more impressive what he did in the European Championship but I was not uh, live on TV because uh, riding uh, five or six minutes ahead of all the best riders uh, in, in a European Championship. It's also crazy. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, I think um, if you saw that race, I think everybody agrees that it's, it's already time for him to go to the pros because uh, in under 23, they would also expect him to win every race. So maybe it was good for him for, to, 
now to live a little bit in the shadow and uh, not really the shadow but but still um, where they don't expect him to win his first race which was would have been a different way if he was still under 23 so I think we can um, give him the time to to really become that that uh, legend that he wants is it also important that he learns other jobs in the team like riding on the front uh, is he going to have to learn about the professional peloton as well yeah i think uh, it would be good for him but uh, you know if if he if they see already in the first race that he can do much more and he can win the races they will not let him uh, um, chase on the uh, on the front but I, he told to me that he want to do it for for sure for for some days to to know what what it is and i think he would be really good at it uh, also so that was Tim de Klerk talking about Remco Evenepoel. It'll be interesting to see what kind of race program Evenepoel has in his first year. Um, being with the Koenig Quickstep, obviously so much focus on the cobbled classics, but uh, it's unlikely that his focus will be on those races, uh, at least in the short term, more likely to blood him in stage races, week-long stage races, and see, see how he goes. Um, always interesting when a rider of such obvious talent comes into the World Tour, and, and the question is, will that talent translate into ability at the very highest level in time of course you know he's so young um four or five years time he'll still be sort of 24 25 um or 23 24 i mean it's it's mind-boggling really but i was looking back at um from the last 25 years or so other riders famous riders who turned pro very early uh, frank vandenbroek of course turned pro for Lotto when he was 19. Filippo Pozzato has just retired and taken up his roller hockey career. Daniel, maybe you've got an, uh, an update on how Pozzato's roller hockey debut went, but he turned pro from Mappe in 2000 at the age of 18 years and three months, so even younger than Eight, I think you'll find, Lionel, just off the top of my head, 18 years, three months and 22 days, if I remember <laughs> correctly. Impressive. And, and, you know, oh, Pozzato, of course, went on to become one of the best roller hockey players in his village. So. And, 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 and Daniel, one of the world's foremost Pozzato scholars, clearly. Yes. Didn't didn't his team lose on his roller hockey debut? His team lost 7-0. Um, Chiro was there, <laughs> a friend of the podcast, <laughs> Chiro Scognamiglio. It was a big local derby, Bassano del Grappa, where we're actually staying on the penultimate night of the Giro. I did our Giro hotels this week. Um, they lost 7-0 to local rivals Valdagno. Um, I asked Chiro for his verdict on Pozzato's performance. He said he looked rusty to me, um, which is understandable. You know, he's been... Um, he's been well, he's spent the last three years of his cycling career looking rusty. Well, exactly. He's been pursuing his <laughs> cycling hobby for the last 20-odd years. No, it's, it's fascinating, Lionel, the, the parallel with Pozzato and, and others. You mentioned Vandenbroeker there, and Vandenbroeker won... Harry Brussels, of course, when he was 20, so the year after he turned professional. Um, Pozzato turned professional in the... It was a kind of a, a sort of satellite team of MAPE, but he was a fully-fledged pro, but they'd set up a, a youth division, and he did about 50 days in his first season of races, but lower-level races, races like the Tour of Chile, Tour of Roads. Um, and He was a contemporary that, of Fabian Cancellara, Charlie Wigalius. Bernard um, Eisel, um, Eisel yeah. yeah there's some very sort of good graduates of of that team and um, you know Pozzato actually talked about this when he retired a couple of months ago and said that he thought that everything sort of started to go wrong in his career when he left the cocoon of that young Mappe team but I think that the really fascinating thing about this question with Evenepoel is that there's no sort of one-size-fits-all the solution um you know, some people react very well um, to being put under pressure very early and others others will fold and others will crumble. And, and um, you know, it's very difficult to know what the best course of action is. I mean, if you think about other sports and, and precocious talents, I mean, if you look at tennis, for example, um, the number of female tennis players who... Um, have come through and been in hot house environments very very young some have thrived like the the Williams sisters for example had very pushy parents and then others who grew up in a similar environment someone like Jennifer Capriati completely completely folded and I think it's you know it can it can be the same in cycling I think one thing that's changed maybe since when Vandenbroek and um 
Pozzato turned professional is that there are much better ways for teams and physiologists and scientists to measure now things like burnout and and to give them the right kind of workload and, and monitor that but even that is no is no real guarantee of of success or or failure it's um it's a very tricky one uh, the one one thing i would say is that i think it will be extra hard for a venipole in a in a belgian team line you mentioned the amount of pressure and the amount of scrutiny that that riders and young riders in particular are subject to in belgium you know in the during the classics there's about uh, a month or six weeks when every one of the belgian papers dedicates about 12 pages to to cycling and and Evenepoel, whether he likes it or not at quick step in particular will be very much in the spotlight and you know i was thinking earlier about young riders um, precocious young riders who have developed very well and why they've developed very well and i, I look at like the yates brothers at, at um well what was orica um and i think they benefited greatly from not being in their home nation um, for for uh, from joining a team where they were out of sight and out of mind and you know for for a belgian in particular you look what happened with with vandenbroeker's career um when he sort of reached his mid 20s and it all went wrong and there were other things in that very incendiary mix as well but um you know the, the pressure of being not just you, you, the, the prodigal son in your family in your team but also in your in a home nation in a nation that's kind of obsessed with cycling i think that is is a tough ask for a young man he does seem quite level-headed and intelligent and self-aware um you know he he's had to already kind of hold his hands up about the clothing and and and, and stress to people that that wasn't it wasn't he wasn't driving that that was his fan club um of other young riders peter sagan as well i mean mm. i remember him at the tour down under age 19 um, and he went on from there, having shown well at the Tour Down Under to win stage at Paris Nice. He was physically well developed as well, even even then, which maybe helped. I mean, the one thing of Enipol has not experienced is suffering. Really, he's not had his head kicked in. I said this in Innsbruck as well. He's not. It, it seems to have come quite easily to him. And the one thing that he will now experience is. Um, uh, it's real suffering in, in races. Well, and losing, Rich. Simply and, and losing, yeah. Simply not winning. I mean, if you look at his palmarès for the last two years, um, I think last year, for example, he won about twenty-five races and didn't win uh, about four. Well, that's not going to be the case in the professional no. ranks, is it? I can no, see. The, I, uh, yeah, I can see the arguments so far. You know, for him turning pro, you know, if he stayed, Patrick Lefebvre makes a point that he would have been signed up by somebody, but. But also, what would he do as an under-23 rider? What would be the point, really? I mean, what would be the point? Would he learn more about the job as an under-23 rider? Or could he be, you know, Tim de Klerk made the point about th- the first thing he's got to do is learn every aspect of racing. And that means picking up bottles and capes and doing the teamwork. And, uh, you know, de Klerk had a, a, a look on his face that he was quite looking forward to schooling uh, the young man in, in the sort of the hard graft of professional cycling and and uh, you know i think we forget that no matter how talented young riders are they have to develop an under understanding and awareness of how the peloton works and and uh, the jobs that need to be done and i think lionel the, the, the key factor um, when it comes down to really is the the kind of internal monologue um in a young rider's head after a year or two years or three years when he goes from being able to pretty much do what he likes in the junior ranks and winning a lot of races to to losing most of the time and you do lose most days in professional cycling and i think you know as long as as long as someone like venipol doesn't absorb that what he's hearing and he will hear things about you know that can become very corrosive in a young rider's head and a young rider's mindset and i think that's you know that's perhaps what happened to pozzato um as long as he can carry on feeling good about what he's doing then i think he'll he'll probably be okay um just to just i mean just to underline be, how young yeah. he is um davide rebellion we we often talk about um who's at the other end of the, the age <laughs> scale um he's he was born 28 years five months and 16 days before remco of um the, the the number one in the billboard t- charts in the usa when davide rebellion was born was 
was um, how can you mend a broken heart by the Bee Gees? And in the UK, it was get it on by T-Rex. When Remco <laughs> Venipol was born, uh, and this was a, a truly great week in modern music, the number one in the UK was What a Girl Wants by Christina Aguilera. Rich, I know you've never heard of Christina Aguilera. And in the UK, it was Britney Spears. Used to ride for uh, Movistar. Britney Spears, born to make you happy. So maybe Remco Venable was born to make us all happy. It's amazing you, you just... N- <laughs> you just know this stuff off it's the top of your head. Your, your pop cultural knowledge incredible. is extraordinary. Shall we hear from another young rider as well? This is uh, uh, a Dutchman, Pascal Eckhorn. I think that's the pronunciation, Eckhorn. Does that um, he's 21. And does that he mean squirrel? Yeah, Dutch. sorry, Daniel. It's very similar to the German Oof. word for squirrel. Well, why don't you look that up while I introduce uh, Pascal Eckhorn, who... He turned pro last year, age 20. He turns 22 soon, but he's 21 at the moment. Um, he's a big sort of rangy rider. And I spent a day with uh, Jumbo Visma, the Dutch team, in December. That's the subject of a friend special that will be out next week. But he was a rider that the coaches I was spending the day with were really interested in and talk, talked about a lot as a, a rider of great potential um, could become a, a sort of classics rider. He's He's sort of in the, the sort of same build, I think, or will be, be the same build as Seth Van Mark, perhaps. Um, quite big. He won two races last year, which is very unusual for uh, a Neo Pro. He won a stage at Copy Bartley and a stage of the Colorado Classic and also rode very well at the Tour of Britain. He was 10th overall there. Um, but a good rider, uh, a great a great talent. But his career with what was then Lotto NL Jumbo got off to a very rocky start because... He was one of the three riders sent home from a training camp a year ago for taking sleeping pills that had not been approved by the team. Uh, they were not banned drugs, but they were, uh, as I say, not approved by the team. Antoine Toluc was the other young rider involved, and Juan Jose Lobato was the, the sort of more experienced Spanish rider who was held to be responsible for this, and he was sacked by the team. The two younger riders were given suspensions, that's Tolhook and Eckhorn. Both of them came back and actually both had really strong seasons. Uh, Tolhook was another sort of revelation last year, rode really well indeed. So you can see why they didn't want to lose them completely, those two riders. Um, so anyway, I spoke to Pascal Eckhorn at the training camp and here's what he had to say. Well, you're, you're, about, well, you're looking ahead to your, your second season with the team. I mean, winning two races last year must, must have been beyond... Three. What was the third one? Team time trial. Okay, team time trial. Okay, I'll give you that. Um, <laughs> uh, but that must have been beyond, you know, your your dreams going into the year, was it? Yeah, I would never uh, su- su- suspect that. Last year, doing the training camp, and yeah, I got some opportunities, and yeah, I was good enough to to win those opportunities. Describe those opportunities, because. Uh, you know, both both in difficult races, one at the start of the season, one at the end of the season. Um, how how did those victories come about? I think I was my basis was good all the all the season long, and yeah, the team gave me some opportunity to go in a breakaway, like in Copa Bartoli or Tour of Flanders, and like in Copa Bartoli we stayed away. With uh, I was together with Lars and Craddock, and yeah, I. I believed in myself that I could fi- could win the sprint of him, and yeah, I won it. And then in Tour of Colorado, we did already a altitude camp before, and we did Tour of Utah, where the whole team was super strong, and Sepp Kuss won, yeah, almost everything. And then in Colorado, yeah, it was going to be a bunch sprint, small small bunch, and I knew I was, yeah, I had good feelings, and I knew I have a good sprint. Yeah, and then the team helped me and I could finish it off and yeah, that's incredible they, they call you the heron I believe yeah, yeah. where does yeah. that come from uh, it's a story I uh, <laughs> it's yeah I don't know I was in Norway I think I always said yeah we have to ride like a heron you know first on one, the other, on one leg and then on the other leg and then like switch all the time that's how it uh, how it started. Well, all the best riders need good nicknames, don't they? So there you are. Um, what what sort? Of, you've obviously got a sprint. You're quite big. I mean, what sort of rider are you gonna? Would you like to become? Um, I did um, Flanders and Roubaix last year, and yeah, I did also like Tour of the Alps and just before the Giro, and 
yeah, I felt I felt that climbing isn't gonna be my thing to win races. And I really like the classics. I also did them when I was younger, you know, in the 23 rings. And yeah, I want to develop in this and try to help the leaders and go into the final. I think we have a really strong team this year. I mean, your, your season last year is kind of even more impressive because you had a difficult start to your career with this team, didn't you? About, well, was it start of the year? How did you react to that at the time? Did you think my professional career has hardly started and 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 it could be over. I mean, what, how 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 did you how did you react to what happened? Yeah, of course, it was yeah horrible start, and uh, I learned a lot from it. And yeah, luckily the team kept me and kept believing in me and gave me the opportunity to yeah start racing in in February in Route of the Soul. And yeah, I worked hard for the leaders, and I think I gained back some trust like day by day. And I think now everything is, is fine and uh, look ahead to the future. Ultimately then a valuable lesson for you? Yeah, definitely. And did it make you also more determined to not put a foot wrong, to, to basically do what the team asked of you and to, you know, as you say, regain the trust? Yeah, of course. You, yeah, the team is like you're having a, having a boss. So at work you also need to follow what you're doing. But... Yeah, in cycling you get opportunities to do something for yourself, but you also need to to be yourself. And there are 30 riders uh, and 40 staff. You need 70 different people, and you need to get there together. And you take some. And yeah, I think uh, I'm not a normal person, but I think there's no cyclist that's really a normal person. In what way are you not normal? Do you think? I don't know. That's what they say, maybe. <laughs> The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science in Sport for supporting the Cycling Podcast. Uh, you can get 25% off still at scienceinsport.com with the code SISCP25. That's SISCP25 at scienceinsport.com. And this week's question for the Science in Sport experts comes from Jim Cotton long-term friend of the podcast here thank you very much jim um his question is how many calories would you suggest aiming for for breakfast prior to a five-hour zone two ride with around six times five minute vo2 max intervals included within it that sounds like a hard ride i tend to have a decent bowl of porridge with berries and an egg for breakfast before such rides which comes out at around 600 calories never too sure how to fuel rides that are largely low intensity and thus lower energy demand when on the road i typically consume around 50 grams of carbs per hour i'm 61 kilograms and train predominantly for mountainous endurance rides can you please let me know if this will make the cut to be answered and if so in which episode i listen to 99 percent of the content but don't want to miss it 99 percent isn't good enough is it jim you're gonna you know i uh, I mean, Jim uh, sounds like a, uh, <laughs> Jim's not messing around. Listen, he sounds like a serious, serious cyclist. A serious cyclist, a climber as well, but it sounds things. Well, Jim, it's in this episode. Over to Ben Samuels. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Jim. So, with the duration and mixed intensities of the ride, breakfast should contain a balance of both carbohydrate and protein. It does sound like you're hitting those two nutrients with the current breakfast, but maybe being a little too carbohydrate dominant for the zone two intensity. I'd suggest slightly decreasing the carbohydrate serving and increase the protein serving. So a smaller bowl of porridge and add a couple of extra eggs. In that way, you're still providing the carbohydrate for energy production, but the higher protein is gonna support muscle remodeling and promote training adaptations that are related to aerobic metabolism. If making that change to breakfast, it's key to maintain your current carbohydrate intake while out on the bike. That's gonna support performance across the duration but also ensure that you have a high quality output in those VO2 max intervals. Thank you for that, Ben, and thanks to Jim Cotton for your question. Keep them coming. Contact at thecyclingpodcast.com or leave a voice memo on the WhatsApp number, which you'll find on our Twitter uh, biog. Uh, now, Dan uh, Daniel, Lionel, that's, that's you, isn't it, Lionel? Um, you uh, also came back from De Kooning Quick Step with an interview with Peter Vakoc, who as you mentioned at the start, had a terrible crash, uh, potentially career-ending crash a year ago, um, but he's poised to, to make his return to racing. He is. He last raced on the 3rd of October 2017 in the uh, Memorial Frank Vandenbroek 
in Belgium, also known as Binch Chime Binch, one day race. Uh, he finished eighth there. Um, if the name Peter Vakoc rings bells to you, it may be because you saw him win Brabant's Appeal, one day race in Belgium a couple of years ago, um, or a stage of the Tour of Britain into Köln in, I think, 2015, that was. Um, and yes, as I said at the start of the show, he was training in South Africa with a couple of quick step teammates and they were clipped by a truck or Vakoch was clipped by a truck. Uh, Jungles wasn't um, involved in the collision. Uh, Lawrence de Plus was and he missed a lot of the season as well. Um, but it's been a long road back for the Czech rider, Peter Vakoch. When the, the racing is, is coming closer, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps. It's... Uh it was hard to, to imagine uh, a year ago, just after the accident, that uh, I would be coming back, but fortunately everything uh, went well. So tell me, what do you remember about the accident? I'm assuming not very much, but what have you pieced together about what happened? Yeah, I just remember the things just like before the accident, when we stopped uh, to get the drinks and food from the car and then restarted again. And it had to happen just like immediately, immediately afterwards because uh, the car wasn't s- still wasn't yet behind us with the coach. And then I just uh, know like when I was waking up and I saw Bob Jungos above me and he was very concerned. And then I was like realizing uh, it took me some time to to realize that I'm in South Africa that we went for training and then. Oh, we had to, to crash and then we were hit by a car. So I remember like this waking up on the ground and just like uh, focusing on being alive. And uh, the most injury was on the back. I had uh, six broken vertebras and uh, one of them was like totally damaged. And uh, I was really lucky that, that my, my spine was, was uh, or like the spine cord wasn't, uh, wasn't severed because it was was very close and uh, in the end uh, the one vertebra had to be uh, basically replaced with uh, metal constructions and some of the, the other vertebras they had to be uh, like uh, pieced together with a, with a screw. In the first weeks I didn't even uh, like think about uh, cycling, I was just like hoping I can recover, I can get back to normal life and honestly like if I can get back to cycling wasn't really my concert in the first uh, couple of weeks. Basically, I was just like happy to to be alive and uh, just focus on the progress and and hope for it. But I didn't have much thoughts like what if I cannot come back. It was just like I want to get healthy and I will do any anything uh, possible for that. When was your first time back on the bike and how big a moment did that feel? I was uh, was beginning of, of June, I think it was first of June, and it was just just incredible. It was it was really nice. It was a completely different feeling than any other time I went on the bike. I just felt free. I just obviously I wasn't really fit, but even then when I pushed the pedal, I just felt like coming to the front. I, I enjoyed the the wind around me and uh, watching the scenery changing around and was like like if I rode the bike for the first time at the beginning I was just uh, like uh, <laughs> super unfit I don't know I think I did uh, maybe 20 kilometers in in one hour or something I was just uh, pushing uh, maybe half of the power than uh, I would push on a, on a normal training but uh, it went really fast and already in July I was able to to follow uh, my teammates in Livigno sometimes for parts of training or or when we just didn't go too hard so like the initial progress was was super super fast from like basically zero fitness to like kind of fit and then then it stopped again then uh, like the initial it was really fast and then just like leveled and was was hard to to progress more but uh, yeah, then I had some more, more issues when I found out that my nerves in the left leg were damaged and uh, nobody really knew how, how big the limitation is and uh, whether it will, uh, it will heal someday or, or not. So then like uh, after the initial excitement of, of coming back was a really difficult period in terms of 
not being sure whether I can make it as a cyclist, but yeah, I just focused on uh, what I could do. Just I was thinking like, yeah, I, I, I will meet the best uh, experts. I will do the best uh, exercises and try, try to do as much and hopefully it will work out. It was impossible not to wish him all the best in his attempts to get back to his previous level. Um, I wonder, you know, the physical um, effects of that incident are one thing, but the mental effects as well. Um, You know, when some people, you hear some people speak and it sounds like they've got a smile on their face. Did he have a smile on his face while he was (laughs) speaking? Because it sounded like that. Yeah, I think he's just delighted to be able to uh, race again. Um, And as he said, you know, it was a, a series of steps to get back to this point the first step was to be able to get out of bed and then it was to be able to get on a bike and then to even think about racing and of course he I definitely got a sense he's very grateful to the team for um, extending his contract and allowing him the opportunity to um, to to try and get back to his previous level um, although it has to be said it would be a pretty heartless team to say sorry your career uh, your contract is up so um, off you go but that that wouldn't be unprecedented that has happened to riders in the past um but yeah it's going to be an interesting um story to follow i think over the uh, next few months to see how he gets on yes line i suspect um his his success going forward will have a lot to do with whether the crash and the accident has um, left any sort of mental psychological legacy um, as is often the case with riders who have bad accidents um, in cycling um, we, we, it's something that happens fairly regularly in cycling that the riders have to curtail their careers due to injury and uh, more than in other sports we've seen various cases over the last uh, few years Adriano Malori is one that that comes to mind uh, Italian rider very good time trialist who was with Movistar who had a bad accident and tried to come back but ultimately um, decided that it would be or he was advised that it would be better um, if he, he didn't carry on um, going further back I remember um, I did a lot of interviews with the American rider Saul Raisin um, who had a bad crash in the circuit de la Sarth, um I think in about 2004-05 Maurizio and Soler again, tried Maurizio Soler as well the correct, the Colombian. correct. And sometimes these riders can be can be faced with a choice. Um, it's compulsory for all uh, world tour professionals, I think pro conti professionals as well, maybe even continental division professionals, to have um, insurance policies. And um, you know, there the, the can be I wouldn't call it a carrot, but um, the the, the, the can be a, a, the prospect of a big insurance payment if they don't come back and they're never able to get on their bike again in a competitive environment um, and, and sometimes I understand or I've heard anecdotally that riders have had to make choices and, and some have ultimately decided to take the money and others have, have um, opted to give it another go and um, Vakoc has obviously decided that he's still got things he wants to achieve in in professional cycling and he's a you know he's a talented rider we've seen that with as you mentioned um, when he won the Brabant's Appeal a couple of years ago um, and it sounds as though he's he's on the right track and um, we certainly hope that's the case Shall we leave it for this week fellas um, next week we're going to we're going to go indoors aren't we a little oh, bit not, not the whole episode mm. Daniel don't worry um, but I, I this week I went to Derby to visit the Hoob Watt Bike team who have been uh, ruffling a few feathers with their team pursuiting uh, at by cycling indoors, so cycling mainly. indoors, and uh, it's the it's the the main well, bugbear that people have. Cycling with them. extremely <laughs> fast indoors. Uh, John Archibald set a sea level world record, or went fastest fastest time ever at sea level recently, a four ten uh, meet a small meeting in Switzerland. Um, it's the British Championships this weekend, which is a big one for them. A couple of their riders in contention for world championship places, but. There is this question of whether they should, in fact, be representing Great Britain at the World Championships in the team pursuit. Um, And very, very interesting time spent with them yesterday. We'll hear that next week. Uh, They've got a few axes to grind and points to prove. And it's it's been a fascinating story there. So we'll hear that next week. I dare say Daniel will even be interested by it. Uh, I think we're also going to hear from Victor Campenarts, aren't aren't we, Daniel, who who fancies a, a tilt at the hour record? 
Yeah, we are. Uh, we will, I think, Rich. Um, I was trying to... I was having a bit of a, a debate with myself um, before we recorded today about why um, I hate indoor cycling so much, but I can tolerate our record attempts. And I think it's because <laughs> riders who take on the hour record tend to treat velodromes a bit like prisons. Um, I, they, they seem to want to get out as quickly as possible. They're in there for an hour and then well, they, they, they can't get return. out. They try. They do their best not to return again for several <laughs> years before they reoffend. You mean they've got a fixed term sentence of 60 minutes? Exactly. I can tolerate our record and then attempts. They escape. I, love it. I can yes. tolerate our record attempts. But, but by that basis, they basically surely. They treat velodromes like Alcatraz. Anyway, go the, on. The team pursuit, which is, you know, three minutes 50, I mean, that's an even shorter period of time to pay attention to indoor cycling yeah but you have to you're but there are several several events a year aren't there team pursuit you have to hang around oh I see and then beautiful to watch though I mean Daniel does your heart not race watching a a well executed team pursuit is there I don't know I don't know is there a better I've never seen one is there a better better spectacle in sport I I ask you I've always turned off by that I'll tell you what I'm going to take your attitude to the Giro this year See how you like I'll it. I'll tell you what, Daniel, I know <laughs> that one of your objections to indoor cycling is that it's indoors. And one of the things you like about outdoor cycling is that it's outdoors <laughs> in mountains and so on. Yeah, exactly. I'll tell you what you might have enjoyed. You might have enjoyed a trip I made a few years ago, well, 11 years ago now, to Bolivia with Chris Hoy when he attempted the world record for a kilometre. That is uh, um, in La Paz, uh, an outdoor velodrome surrounded by the Andes. And wow. it is absolutely spectacular i think that well that, that is might, one of my main issues that Richard. might be it's that might be the, the velodrome for you did you like the as i you like the olympics in 92 where the track events were held in an outdoor velodrome or colin sturgis won his world professional pursuit championship at an outdoor velodrome in leon i think i was too young to be aware of it Lionel. but as I, as I explained to you guys earlier in the week in a text message um yeah my main problem with indoor cycling is that it's it's countryside free cycling <laughs> There are no views. There are no landscapes. Um, mm. Yeah, we're all... Mm. Oh, well. We can dull. explore this a bit anyway. more next week. Uh, <laughs> no, no, Lionel's shaking his head. Uh, a little <laughs> reminder, this week we've released the second podcast, Femina, the January episode. We've got interviews in there with Abby Van Twisk, who's signed for Trek Segafredo. Hannah Barnes, the Canyon Sram rider, really, really interesting on some of the challenges of being a professional bike rider and living in Girona, where she lives with her partner, Teo Gagan Hart. And, and also just contrasting the sort of support and resources available in the women's uh, peloton to what's available to Teo as a member of Team Sky. She was really honest, and it's, it's really interesting. Also, Iri Slappendel, the retired Dutch rider who set up the Cyclist Alliance and is doing a lot of work to improve uh, conditions for women riders. And she's really interested about Orla Shinui, went to see her, uh, she lives in Rotterdam, I believe. So that's out now. Coming next week is our well, it's, it's uh, is it our first friend special of 2019, or is it our fifth friend special of 2019? Hard well, to say. Second, second, second really, proper one. It? Okay, uh, and it is my day with Jumbo Visma. Uh, you'll hear from Stephen Kreuzwick, Primoz Roglic, uh, Richard Plug. Very interesting on the journey he's been on in rescuing that team from the ashes of Rabobank and building it into a team that is on a lot of people's radar uh, as a team that's that's really uh, become pretty formidable in the Grand Tours, but also with Pascal Acorn, who we heard earlier, and Wout van Aert, uh, who's joining the team this year, potentially in the Classics as well. Um, quite a, an all-round team. Dylan Grunewigen as well, the sprinter. So they're, they're fighting on numerous fronts, and I hope people find that interesting. I certainly did. You can become a friend of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. Uh, it costs fifteen pounds to uh, listen to all the special episodes we'll release for friends of the podcast this year. That's all for this week. Thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Chap. You have been listening to the Cycling Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast dot com to get all the latest news and special offers delivered straight to your inbox. This episode was edited and produced by Tom Wally.